This is a production of PBS Charlotte. In Rock Hill, South Carolina. Growing up, we knew where we, we could go and be safe, and we knew where not to go. At the start of the 1960s. It was not a Norman Rockwell painting. There's an unequal division of race and an uncertain ending for those who took a stand against the system. You could be uh, murdered, you could be end up missing, you could be beaten up. But some brave individuals decided to buck the system. You know, you go downtown, you march, you pick it back and forth, and the people screaming and hollering and yelling at you. Then, a shift in strategy. Jail, no bail. January 31st, 1961. Enough of us got together and we said, enough is enough. They were called the Friendship Nine. We did what we had to do because other folk were afraid. Mm -hmm. And in this historic sanctuary, Reverend Cecil Ivory helped the group find its voice. He was willing to sacrifice, and he was willing to do whatever he could. Over half a century later, the daughter of this brave community leader shares her late father's papers. There's a telegram that he sent to Robert F. Kennedy. There's a letter that he wrote to John F. Kennedy. Here, written in his own words, his own handwriting. We do not protest against you. We protest your evil and unjust system of segregation and discrimination. In the 1970s, Rock Hill's African-American community would take another hit. We had to move because urban renewal came through and we had to relocate. Many of the businesses did not survive. In this trail of history, meet the Rock Hill men and women who took a stand against injustice. Hear from an author inspired by the Friendship Nine to write a children's book. Learn how eminent domain tore apart a once vibrant black business district. And see how the Rock Hill community recognizes this troubled past, honors those who fought for justice, and teaches future generations. The following episode of Trail of History is brought to you by Central Piedmont Community College and viewers like you. Thank you. Bragg Financial Advisors, a family-owned wealth management firm providing investment management and tax and estate planning for families, individuals, and institutions for more than 50 years. Committed to our clients, to education, and our community. Today, the small town of Rock Hill, South Carolina isn't so small and welcomes just about everyone. It's a challenge to imagine life here any other way. It was uh, totally segregated. You had like, the black section, the white section. It had boundaries where we could go to certain areas and other areas we knew not to go unless we were trying to be mischievous. At the time, those boundaries, black and white, were part of the culture. You know, when you're young, your mother and your father and your grandmother and all these tell you, grandfather, don't go over there, son, you know, and you didn't. You, you, you learned to enjoy where you were. I was trained where to stay and where not to go. The separation was Sunset Park, and then Freedom Road and Crawford Road. And if you got into any of those places, you were safe. But if you got outside of the boundaries, watch out, anything could happen. And most of the people after six o'clock, they would uh, refrain from going there because uh, a lot of bad things could happen at, at night. See, back then, uh, it wasn't uncommon to uh, have a family member missing. I had a, a cousin that uh, he didn't get missing, but he got hung. In the era of Jim Crow, across the South, the sign said it all. Pictures like these from the 1930s and 40s capture moments in time, showing a divided society. During that time, uh, 
we, I experienced the, the separation of, of restrooms. There weren't any restrooms in Rock Hill, uptown, for black people, period. Uh, you couldn't go to a restroom. And then they had separate uh, drinking facilities. If you want to drink a water, it was explicitly written above the water fountain who could partake of that water in that fountain. So it was all over Rock Hill, this uh, separation of, of, of status. During the 50s, traveling, you, a lot of time you couldn't stop at some places. It, was, it wasn't that hard. Uh, we were used to it, so it wasn't that hard. We just made do with it. We couldn't uh, do very much of anything in uh, the stores. We couldn't even pick up the items uh, as, as teenagers. Put that down. You don't have any money. We had to buy it take it home, and if it didn't fit or whatever we could wear, we'd have to bring it back. It was, it was rudeness. Um, Caucasian kids didn't have the same problem. Even grabbing a bite to eat was a different experience for African Americans. I always want a cherry Coke and a BLT. And so I would have to go and stand at the end of the counter to get it and be waiting on. I couldn't sit down and eat it. By the late 1950s, the fight for equality and an end to segregation had made its way to Rock Hill. One of the catalysts was uh, when um, Annie Austin White, a domestic um, worker, was riding the bus home and um, was ready to sit down and she was invited to sit down by a white person. And of course, the bus driver heard that and of course said, no, she couldn't do that. So she said, if I can't sit here, then let me off the bus. At some point in time, they spearheaded a, a boycott of, of the buses and pretty much met and um, planned a strategy for how to get people to and from work without having to depend on massive transportation. First, the bus boycott in the picket lines. Phyllis Hyatt, known as a city girl, saw it firsthand. And so most of my signs said, you know, you, won't, uh, you want our money, but you will not let us eat in your lunch counters. One guy, he, he had on some white boots I would never forget. And he stepped his boot right out in front of me and he spit. And so, of course, I stopped and looked at him, and the whole line stopped. And our president at that time was uh, Robert McCullough. And he came back and he said, Phyllis, are you okay? I said, I'm fine. And there was a white lady. She was standing on the side. She walked over and hugged me. She said, honey, you all right? He's not going to bother you. They had one incident where I was walking the picket line, and this young kid, he, he had to be no more than 15, 16. He threw a piece of cardboard and hit me in the temple. And, and that's the first time I, anybody ever hit, hit me with anything. And I stopped and I took a good long look at him and that guy was gonna go run through him or something. And the guy behind me said, man, hey, you gotta keep moving. So I kept moving around and picking. In the fall of 1960, here at the old Herman Presbyterian Church and in private homes, some local civil rights leaders started to consider new tactics. The climate had become stagnant. Uh, there were a lot of protests and boycotts and such, but the civil rights movement as a whole had become a little bit stagnant and it needed to be re-energized, rejuvenated to a degree. And for the first time, the community was confronted with Negroes in places where they had never been. Across the country, lunch counter sit-ins were in full swing, often ending in arrest. But up until this point, the protesters paid a fine to avoid jail time. That money went straight into the city's coffer. We thought if they, we kept doing it, they would finally get tired of all the paperwork, locking us up, putting it through the different things, and they would, would get tired of that but then find out 
they was enjoying it because they would keep putting the money in the coffin and we were just helping them out. Every time we were arrested before the uh, jail no bail came about, we paid the fine. Everybody, the NAACP paid and SNCC paid and Southern Christian leaders paid, but the, fine, the fines were paid. So they had to somehow stop that system, that economic system that was depleting the black communities and even some white communities who did want to help with the, the civil rights movement. Finally, Thomas Gaither, our leader, our fearless leader from Great Falls, South Carolina, said, okay guys, it's time for us to make a change. He, he went on and elaborated and said, uh, we are going to sit at the lunch counter and we're going to stay at the lunch counter and they're going to have to arrest us and put us in jail. We went through training of, of nonviolence, of accepting physical punishment, physical abuse, physical assault, that anything that we thought would happen up on that street, they dramatized it during that training. They talked to him all the time, and Reverend Cecil Ivory, I never forget him, he was just saying, you know, if you can't do it, you know, bow out. I almost said, no, I'm not going to do that because uh, I have a little bit of a temper, not so much. And uh, if it's released, uh, it could be dangerous. January 30th, 1961, a day frozen in their minds, a day the group took action. It was a bitter cold morning. That is the one thing that stuck out in their mind the most. They said they'd had cold mornings before, but there was something about this morning that was particularly cold. And they remembered that more than anything. And they bundled up and they, they said 40 some people came to say they were gonna sit in on that day. And when it all boiled down to it, only 10 of them showed up. I know that they had fear, but they never showed. It was strong, you know, and you had to be. And so those 10 young men made that one mile trek from Friendship College over to McCrory's Five and Dime, and that's where the sit-in began. So somewhere between zero and 60 seconds, or even 59 seconds, they were yanked from their seats. So they really did not have time to sit there long enough to even make an impact as far as causing any type of disruption, as what they were accused of doing is trespassing and disturbing the peace. In court, eight Friendship College students, Robert McCullough, John Gaines, Clarence Graham, W.T. Dub Massey, Willie McCloyd, James Wells, David Williamson Jr., Mac Workman, and Chris Taylor, along with Congress of Racial Equality field organizer Thomas Gaither, pled guilty and refused to pay the fine. Instead, they opted for 30 days in jail. A ninth student named Charles Taylor, fearful of losing his scholarship, chose to pay the fine. And when the realization hits you, when no bars close and that key rattle in that door and you and it dawns on you that you can't get out you know you've never been locked up before it's it's quite an experience we knew exactly what we needed to do we didn't do things that were um, detrimental to anybody's health we didn't do anything to hurt anybody financially the movement prospered because people started going to jail and staying in jail all across the country. Dr. Martin Luther King had never done that before. See, this was the first, Rock Hill was the first experimental stage of that movement, of that type. And everybody adapted it afterwards. Three years later, President Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Some of the key parts of the law banned discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, or nation of origin in schools, workplaces, and places of public accommodations, such as the lunch counter. 
In the coming years, Congress would pass the Voting Rights Act and other civil rights legislation. <laughs> During the civil rights movement, African-American churches played a huge role. Many of the leaders were pastors, clergy, or elders in the community. Reverend Cecil Ivory fit the mold. Reverend Ivory was pastor of this church, you know. Bobby Player grew up at the old Herman Presbyterian Church. When the congregation moved, he purchased the building to preserve it. And I couldn't see us losing this church. He remembers Reverend Ivory. He was a well-versed preacher. He was a graduate of Johnson C. Smith in Charlotte. And here, spread out on this kitchen table, are numerous newspaper clippings and Reverend Ivory's personal papers documenting his role in the Rock Hill Civil Rights Movement. And I call it, a, it's an archives in a, in a, in a briefcase. Darnell Ivory was just a young girl when her father, Reverend Ivory, was leading the fight against injustice as the local president of the NAACP. He was willing to sacrifice and he was willing to do whatever he could to have a voice and to make people aware of the mistreatment of, of Negroes then, Blacks, African Americans. And he was consistent about it and he was determined and to the day that he passed, he continued to fight for those injustices for equality. Reverend Ivory engaged in the fight, both with action and with the pen. There's a telegram that he sent to a Robert F. Kennedy. There's a letter that he wrote to John F. Kennedy. There are letters that my father wrote to the Friendship Nine when they were doing the jail Nobel and how he wanted to be there with them and that he was willing to run a red light or speed to get arrested. So there's a, there's a lot here. There are letters that people who didn't agree with integration, didn't agree that blacks deserve to be treated equally. And in his own words. If we do not qualify, do not accept us. If we do, do not reject us because of the color of our skin. And then he says, God is no respecter of persons. Are you better than God? We do not protest against you. We protest your evil and unjust system of segregation and discrimination. The collection gives a snapshot of the times and an excerpt from an unsigned letter paints a picture of what the Reverend was up against. The only white people who want amalgamation are communists. The leadership of the left wing National Council of Churches and Fools we white people don't want to eat next to you, nor do we want our children going to the same schools. They call him the Martin Luther King of, of, of Rock Hill. And if I, anyone I talk to, the Friendship Nine, um, just people in general who were, who were there during the time of, of civil rights movement, they, talk about what my father, the difference that my father made in their lives and in the lives of, of the people um, that he worked with. And he was, he was a fighter. I have never in my life met a person that was so genuine and so sharp and so eloquent. Uh, that nobody could touch him. The man was a marvel. But to Darnell. My memory of my dad is, um, he's just that, he was my dad. He was someone that I saw working as a minister, a preacher at, at, at Herman Presbyterian Church. We also saw him as a, um, he liked people. Um, he was a, I know the word charismatic, and I say that word charismatic, but I, I don't think he was charismatic as much as he was caring. He was sensitive to what I remember the needs of people, and, and he cared. Um, and he could, could relate to anyone, and somehow his ability to, um, 
communicate. And the way he talked and the way he spoke, um, I think it put people at ease. The civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s is a difficult subject to grasp, and even harder for later generations to understand just what life was like in America before the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and later amendments to the Constitution. But educator and author Dr. Kim Johnson wanted to find a way to tell the story of the Friendship Nine to children in elementary school, which brings us here to a book titled no fear for freedom, because this was about freedom for these men even 54 years after. It was about their freedom so that they could leave this earth knowing that they had done nothing wrong and there was no mark on their life. So that's kind of how we came up with the title, No Fear for Freedom. Vanessa Thompson illustrated the book, and as Johnson points out, the pictures draw you in. When I look at that picture here, I feel the sadness of these men that have, that have been locked up and they're not really sure why and they're just trying to wait and figure out what's going to happen. So I wanted each page to take you back to that 1961 feel. While researching the book, Johnson had to take some time to process her own emotions. I felt angry. I was. Because I thought, how can human beings treat each other this way? I had to peel through my own prejudice, bias, judgment to get to how do I take this message and elevate it into something positive so we can start reflecting on ourselves and saying, am I doing everything I can to make this a better world? When we all come together to put our differences aside, there will be no room left for racism if that's what we decide. That's so cool, if that's what we decide. The wheels of progress never stopped in Rock Hill, but some of that transformation came at a high cost. The black business district in Rock Hill up through the 1960s and early 70s was located on Black Street, centered on Black Street, across the railroad primarily from the main part of downtown Rock Hill. In the 1970s, there were some major projects to move railroad lines, to create grade-separated crossings, to build Dave Lyle Boulevard as a connector from downtown out to I-77. Uh, it was a period of urban renewal. Um, so a lot of changes were taking place in downtown Rock Hill, and unfortunately, all those changes ended up destroying what was the center of the African-American business district. John Ramser owns Robinson Funeral Home, which has been in this family for more than a century. You can trace its history back to his aunt and uncle. He remembers the once vibrant business district. Well, that was uh, the central point, just like downtown is the central point for the city of Rock Hill. That was the central point for black people. And you could go into one location, a two block area, and you could get just about anything you wanted. And we had all the businesses together, most of them together there. Had film home, we had beauty parlor, we had barber shop, we had taxi stand, we had liquor store, we had a service station. Robinson's funeral home was lucky. Ramser was able to move from the black business district and survive. Many of the businesses did not survive once they were, the business, they were torn down on Black Street, which was really a loss to the community. Dr. Gladys Robinson chaired the committee to build this monument at the corner of Black Street and David Lyle to recognize the Black Business District. In, in recent years, there is more of an interest and effort to recognize the diversity within the city and to uh, acquire an appreciation for the history of the, the diverse community. In November 2016, Rock Hill dedicated the Freedom Walkway. We decided that rather than just building a functional walkway, pouring concrete, putting down pavers, that we would try to do something more. That um, this was an opportunity to tell stories in our community. There's the civil rights history that happened at the Woolworth Dime Store and the adjacent McCrory Store. This was an opportunity for our community to do something special. This is about liberty and justice for all, for everybody in our community, and so, it's a place where we can honor certainly the African-American struggle for justice, but the Catawba Indian struggle for justice, women's struggles for justice. I mean, countless groups have struggled to find their place in our society 
and this is a place to honor all of those folks. Well, I think it's just, it's, it's so important for our young people to have an awareness of, of the history of Rock Hill, which is why the, the monument and the walkway have just filled a void uh, that has been there for, for, for so long. I think it's important because until you acknowledge um, the struggle and the injustices that people have faced in the past, you can't move forward. 54 years after the Friendship Nine were sentenced to 30 days in jail, a South Carolina judge dismissed the convictions. And so I think Rock Hill has taken a very monumental step towards that and that we still have a long way to go. By no means are we there yet. We still have a long way to go, but we are starting to take those steps so that we can come together as a wonderful community and show that we can all live in the same space and we can all remain true to who we are, our culture and our history, and at the same time, show the world how to get along and find peace. Thank you for watching this episode of Trail of History. of PBS Charlotte.